everybody. Uh, my name is David Coyles. I'm a lecturer in architecture. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, and also a researcher. And for the past five years, myself and some colleagues have been running a research project looking at what we've been calling hidden barriers. Uh, the projects have been funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And we have a multidisciplinary team, but it's primarily looking at architecture. And when people think about Belfast and divisive architecture, they tend to think about the peace wall structures. Would I be right in assuming that some people have seen images of the peace walls before? These are purpose-built uh, concrete walls and fences put there to separate uh, Catholic and Protestant communities in contentious areas. So we're looking at something quite different. Uh, it's actually the confidential and secret use of ordinary everyday bits of the built environment to purposely separate communities um, with the aid of making them more peaceable, or with the aim of making them more peaceable. Now, one of the things that's often overlooked about the Troubles conflict, or the Troubles, sorry, is the idea that it was a very, very urban conflict. Uh, this was a conflict that took place literally on the streets of the city, uh, ordinary residential streets. So in the late 1970s, the inner city of Belfast was full of housing that had been in existence pretty much since the late 1850s. Uh, very, very dire state. So there was an opportunity um, for large-scale urban renewal, which was needed. Alongside that, you have the conflict playing out. And a secret government committee was formed to see how they could think about redeveloping the city in a way that might make it easier to police and reduce confrontation between Catholics and Protestants in contentious areas. So in a way, this process of urban renewal provided a degree of subterfuge for these kinds of military-led interventions to take place. In our work, uh, we've identified three different types of hidden barriers that were actually put in place. And they operate at three different levels. So the first type of barrier is what we're calling an inter-community barrier. These are instances where large-scale uses of the built environment have been introduced to simply separate two areas that were formerly connected. And the best way to actually illustrate the kind of impact these things have is, is by example. So, for example, we have in yellow, this is in North Belfast, the map from 1978, you have a Catholic area, Ardoyne, Catholic area, Cliftonville, and a Protestant area, Lower Old Park. Uh, at this time, whenever this area was being redeveloped, the government were quite concerned that because of the numbers of Catholics pouring in to Ardoyne and Cliftonville, that these areas would join up and in doing so swallow up the Protestant area of Lower Old Park, thus creating what they refer to as uh, an uncontrollable Catholic ghetto. Their, their words, not mine. Um, so to ensure that that didn't happen, they built this industrial estate on top of the abandoned Protestant housing to make sure that you can see this would be the Catholic housing, this is the industrial estate and the link road and this is the little bit of Protestant housing. So what we have today, whilst the two areas did join, the industrial estate provides a buffer that keeps it separate from the Protestant community that remained in the area. In another example, you have a similar situation. You have Catholic area, Twinbrook, Protestant area, Arena. 
and a shared green space and link road between the two settlements. Now this was an area that was actually quite stable. But whenever tensions were running high in the city, there would be intermittent fights between youths in the area on this green field. And people became very concerned on the government that perhaps, again, Catholics living in this area might spread across and take over the Protestant Arima estate. So a four-lane dual carriageway was put in place to separate the two. Fully embedded into the environment today, permanently separating the two areas. In another area, you have uh, a site for new Catholic housing at Ligonil, an existing Protestant housing estate at Squires Hill, and again a concern in this in this instance that by building Catholic houses here, Protestants will flee the Squires Hill estate allowing Catholics who are moving in here to take over and create another Catholic ghetto. So a landscape barrier was put in place to make sure that there was no physical or visual link between the existing Protestant houses here and the Catholic houses here. Another barrier that's fully embedded into the built environment today. Inter-community barriers are something different they take place within a single identity community, so within a Catholic area or a Protestant area. And the idea here was to take an area that during the Troubles, oh, pardon me, where the street network was highly interconnected, meaning that terrorists could weave in and out, um, commit an attack and leave again, to change it to an area that you couldn't actually move around and might be safer. So, very crude instances of architecture being used to literally block streets, stop people moving around. In this instance, a house literally put in the middle of an old street. But creating areas that are now very, very insular and inward looking, at that time they might be secure and private. But it begs the question of what it's like to live in an area like that today. And then the final type of barrier that we find are what were called hidden boundaries. These are actually instances where everyday bits of Belfast have become recognized as territorial landmarks between two communities. For example, a park, which is an ordinary public park, but for the locals in the area, it represents the area where Catholic territory starts, and Protestant territory stops. Or school playing fields that some people on our tour saw this morning that actually represent the buffer between Catholic and Protestant areas. A traffic island seems completely benign but is actually recognized locally as the boundary between a Catholic area and a Protestant area. And a road that is recognized as a Catholic route so Protestants who live nearby will walk half an hour in another direction before they'll actually walk up here to use the local shops. Begs the question of what do you do next? Peace walls, as problematic as they are, are highly visible, highly recognizable, and you probably can take them down if you want to. Much more difficult to remove a road, to take down dense vegetation and planting, or to remove an industrial estate. So we've begun to engage with policymakers and have presented our research and we have a couple of recommendations of thinking about how things might move incrementally, beginning to transform these barriers at a local level and perhaps making small interventions that might make a difference. But we don't have a functioning government in Northern Ireland, haven't had one for two years. There is no policy looking at hidden barriers. Everybody talks about the peace walls. Nobody's looking at this kind of stuff, and in many ways, it's this kind of stuff that's a lot more insidious and probably continues to promote division uh, in greater ways. And I'll just say something to finish uh, that my colleagues who presented before me said, um, we've met a lot of great people at the conference so far, and I'd be really keen to hear your thoughts on the work, or if you think there are overlaps with what you're interested in, 
or tangential research avenues, please do get in touch and let us know what you think. Thank you.